Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Process Podcast. Ash, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the show, so I'm flattered to be asked. Great. Uh, how are you doing today? All good? Very well, thank you. Yeah, can't complain. Perfect. Um, so I, uh, we've had a couple of back and forwards and we've had a, a quick chat about what we're going to talk about today. But um, for the listeners that don't know you, um, perhaps we should go into a bit of detail on your background, how you got into, how you got to where you are today. Um, far away. Sure. Um, my name's Ash Grossman. I am primarily a coach specializing in biomechanics. I guess in terms of background, growing up, I played all the sports, um, rugby being my main one. And as relates to my career now, I guess the, the defining moment was a neck and shoulder injury that I got when I was about 14, which was bad, but not that bad. It's basically like a whiplash type injury. And for the next 10 years, I was in and out of physio, just constantly um, having flare ups of this neck and shoulder injury. Basically, my trap would spaz out and I wouldn't be able to look right for one to three days after a match where I was making a lot of tackles. Really that or... high? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just like <laughs> absolutely locked up. Um, and this would just come and go. It would have good patches and bad patches. And I think. As a teenager, I felt like a professional athlete going to see the physio every week and I would do my stretches, do my exercises, but it just was in this cycle on and off for literally 10 years when I started working into my early 20s. And by that point, I was just getting a bit fed up because I was diligently doing everything that I was being told to do, but I just never broke out of the cycle. It would just continually reoccur. I saw shoulder surgeons, got MRIs, got everything done to see what was going on. And structurally, there's nothing significant happening. But in terms of my experience, it was being massively impacted by this annoying niggly injury. Mm -hmm. So when I was uh, starting work and in the office, and actually prior to that, I've always loved sport and training. So I always consumed as much information as I could to understand how to train better, more effectively. And I remember being in the office, not doing my job and browsing the internet, just looking for different schools of thought on how to treat these sorts of injuries. And I sort of came across um, functional training, uh, something called Mobility Wad, the website that Kelly Sturette used to run. Yeah. And it opened my eyes that there was another school of thought out there that we could train for performance and function rather than just aesthetics. I think the bulk of the body of knowledge in fitness comes from bodybuilding from the 70s, where everybody was just obsessed with it. Yeah. And I think I started pulling at those threads, going down the rabbit hole, just figuring out that there was so much information kind of available and people were looking into things in a slightly different way that, you know, we should be training our body to do things rather than to look a certain way. And injuries like mine weren't, that significant and could be treated, but the treatment was much more around movement patterns and uh, muscle sequencing. And yeah, that basically started a long learning journey of just trying to understand it in as much detail as I could until flash forward today. Now that's what I do for a living. I help people with their muscle imbalances, perform biomechanical assessments, whether that's to get them out of pain or to unlock the next level of their performance. It's all about seeing how the body moves and then trying to speak to it in the language that it likes, which is movement rather than I think sort of isolated stretches or traditional rehab exercises. Yeah. So, um, so, so the people that you work with at the moment, I know that you do a lot within CrossFit. Um, talk to us about general demographic that you, that you work with. Sure. So, yeah, I think um, when I was transitioning out of my corporate job, my first job in fitness was in a CrossFit gym um, just through people I knew got some work experience there and obviously it resonates strongly in terms of functional training for a body that can do things rather than look a certain way and I've just sort of made my home in in CrossFit both as a sport as a, and also as a tool for the general public so the people I work with are generally um, a company I work with called WIT they they're their um, mission is to work with the training obsessed. And I think that that typifies my average athlete or client in that they can be any level. They can be CrossFit Games champions or they can be, um, you know, Joe Bloggs, who just absolutely loves training and yeah. 
a lot of those people are in CrossFit, but I get people from all other sports as well. But the unifying um, descriptor is that they just love training, whether it's yeah. for a sport or just to train itself. Yeah. So talk to me about your role within WIT. So is it kind of like a partnership? Do you work for them? How, how does that? So I was one of the original coaches when the gym opened up. So oh, if, if you're not familiar with WIT, it's basically a huge um, sports retail company. So it was started as a clothes shop selling all the best CrossFit merch that you couldn't get anywhere else. I remember I bought my first uh, skipping rope to learn double unders with from them when they were just a, like a tiny basement store in a, a back street. Was that street. Brick Lane or something, wasn't it? Yeah, Bow, Bow Lane, I think it was. Or Bow Street, I always get them mixed up. And um, yeah, there's any place you could buy lifters, weightlifting belts, all that sort of stuff. And it's evolved to be this, this massive uh, company now where they sponsor the CrossFit Games and have big partnerships with all the major brands. And we opened a gym in end of 2017 um, in London. And it was kind of the first really snazzy CrossFit gym because it was central London, great location incredible quality of equipment and I think a few gyms have subsequently mirrored that in terms of moving away from the traditional spit and sawdust CrossFit gym yeah. garage Industrial gym state. yeah exactly whereas people in the city you know they're going to go get into their suit before they go to work they probably yeah. want nice shower facilities and stuff like that so I was one of the, the coaches who uh, started the gym back then and since then, I've sort of transitioned into an ambassador role, I guess. So I do some workshops there. Um, I don't coach any regular hours anymore, but I also do my muscle imbalance assessments out of wit um, and another gym. And it's kind of like a nice family, I guess, as the, the company has grown, more and more people have joined it. And it's great to still be involved. Yeah, I just uh, I think that uh, you and I have. Have similar from me understanding your background of what you did before getting into coaching similar to me in that I've kind of worked in corporate not at the same level that you did but um, experiencing kind of a completely different side of the world and then going into coaching so just quickly talk about how how that came about um, or like what the difference is really between the two how, what you feel the difference is I like one versus the other. I think that's probably the main one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I actually never hated my job when I was consulting. I think, I guess there's a weird thing in offices that I, I talk about with my friends nowadays that it's almost like people aren't fully themselves. There's this professional veneer that everyone wears that, yeah. you know, you don't, fully express yourself you don't talk about your personal lives in full detail whereas I think fitness is almost the complete other end of the spectrum that everyone lays everything bare you know when you're peating someone they'll tell you some things that they won't tell their closest friends or their partners yeah and it just has this ability for people to be to fully self-express or be more more authentic and I think for me moving to fitness was very liberating because I just talked about everything I wanted to talk about anyway when I was in the office I was sneaking off at lunchtime to go to the gym for as long as I could anyway yeah. just because I'd rather be there than in the office so I think that's something really palpable switching industries that everyone who works in fitness wants to work in fitness whereas a lot of people who work in corporate don't really want to be there but they might be there for the money or for the prestige yeah, or whatever it might be yeah yeah, yeah exactly I think that's uh over time with me with coaching is what what's really developed my passion for it is more the relationships mm. the building because of like you talked about the authenticity that you have with people especially when you're working with someone on a one-to-one -one basis you are forced in a way really to like to connect or to try and understand that person um exactly. and then over time as you do that you know you you build such strong relationships it's, it's like you're working with friends definitely and your um your so your your when you work with the people in the gym when you do your imbalance assessments because my i i know that a lot of physios i know not saying that you are a physio but it's kind of similar in a way they you know they have uh, someone come in with an injury they have a few sessions maybe a 10 session pack or something like that and then 
that's the end of their relationship until they get an injury again. Is that similar to how you operate? Is it kind of like in and out or, you know, do you write programs regularly for people? What, what, what does it look like? Yeah. So um, for the muscle imbalance assessments, I'd say the vast majority is pretty much one and done. Like most people I see um, probably not a great thing business wise, but depending on what's going on with their body, We'll do an assessment to figure out what's going on, design them sp some specific exercises to address whatever that is, and then they'll go away, work on them. And that might, might be enough to get them to a place that they want to be and able to do the training they want to do. Yeah. Other people I'll see more regularly. These might be athletes where um, no one moves perfectly. I think that needs to be said. So if you want to operate at a very high level, you're always optimizing and trying to find extra bits of efficiency to squeeze out of your performance. Um, so some of those people I'll see semi-regularly, like every three to six to 12 weeks, depending on what's going on in their training or in their body, if they've had an accident or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's for the muscle imbalance assessments, how it typically goes. I also coach some people remotely. So just standard online programming and coaching um, where it's much more of an ongoing thing and they might see me for a muscle imbalance assessment, depending on, yeah, what state their body's in and why they're working in the first place. Some people are just athletes who want to perform better with no injuries and that's simple. And, and those people that you have that are repeat clients, is it kind of a smorgasbord of what they're training towards or is it very CrossFit specific or is it more gen pop or what does it look like? Much more CrossFit specific, I would say, with, a, uh, yeah, with also some functional fitness gen pop. Yeah. Way. Nice. Yeah. Um, so I think what I'd like to talk about really is what your imbalance assessments kind of look like sure. um, without giving away trade secrets. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What, you know, what, why is it that you're assessing the things that you're assessing and what does that general structure look like? Sure. So there's no um, fixed structure that I apply in a muscle imbalance assessment. It's very uh, specific to the individual's injury and their sport so it's one of the things i teach on my mentorship is we always want to be as specific as possible as we can to the client and their goals because say someone's got a knee injury you would assess it differently if their knee injury is from running versus from squatting even though the pain might present as the same and you'd also treat it differently and train it differently because obviously yeah. the demands on the knee are very different but in general the first part will always be quite a long consultation just to understand their training history and their injury history, because the chronology of when things have happened to them is really important. If they've broken a leg when they were six years old and had a formative part of their life leaning on one side, or they've rode on one side of the boat for 20 years, these pieces of information are really instrumental in understanding how their body works and the strategies it might have adopted to perform whatever sport or training that they're asking to do it now ask it to do now and once i've got an idea of maybe some plausible explanations for why the pain might have come about in the first place like how has their training changed over the last few months or in the lead up to the injury then i've got some clues to steer the assessment to say right if they broke their leg then maybe they Simple, it could be as simple as they've shifted weight onto the other leg for a long period of time and compensations might have arisen as a result of that. Then in the assessment, I'll break the body down into the major joints of the ankles, the hips, the spine and the shoulders. And obviously, if the injury has more um, detail around the smaller joints, then we'll look at those. And essentially, we're looking at the mobility of each area, the stability of each area but also the motor control. So how well does their body coordinate um, both on a specific joint level, but globally overall. So if they're looking to do something like run or snatch, it's obviously a full body, very coordinated motion. So they might have great mobility when we look at the ankle on its own, but how well does that ankle produce mobility under speed in a snatch, for example? And they can be very, very different. Someone could have amazing dorsiflexion when they're doing a knee to wall test, but then as soon as they go into a snatch, you don't see any of it. Yeah. So comparing those three key movement qualities and seeing where there are mismatches combined with the injury history and training history gives us some clues as to what strategies the body might have adopted. And once yeah. we can see what it's missing, we've 
you basically identified what the training stimulus they need is. So say they don't load their right leg. It could be as simple as that. We need to create a training stimulus that loads the right leg relevant to their training goal. Because again, like training the right leg more for running is slightly different to how you train it to get people onto the right leg for snatching. And yeah. then we start designing exercises that achieve that training stimulus for them to integrate into their program. Yeah. I guess it's like what you're talking about. Some of that there is the the different when you were talked about the the knees going over the toes and the snatch or not having that range. It's the difference between their passive and active range that what they're firing to be able to do that. Um, and then also from from my experience of uh, of doing assessments myself, where you know a client's come in, they say, "Oh, knees been feeling a bit dodgy." Or when you're when not when I'm going through an initial consultation with a client, taking them on for personal training. I'll do something similar where, you know, you have the consultation and then you're trying to understand, you know, where that potential injury might have come about. And then rather than where I think a lot of people will jump to, like you said, is that they, oh, I injured my shoulder from the snatch. And it's like, well, it may have been that's what was what caused the injury. But what's the actual what's the mechanics going on there? Is it that is anything to do with the snatch do we need to break down that snatch movement into its different individual parts is it something that's going on with the overhead squat with the overhead position with you know something lower body so i think yeah the the kind of the gist of what i'm getting from you is similar to how we we would go about it at coastal where we're and process where we're looking at rather than the whole movement in itself break those movements down into smaller pieces and and then try and build the connection like you said when the moment we add speed that's when everything goes wrong so how do we incrementally add that in exactly yeah i think it's just everything's scalable both from a, a load perspective everyone kind of sees it but a movement perspective but also from a i guess those fundamental qualities of mobility and stability there are ways of tweaking those up and tweaking them down so you can give like you can if you give somebody more stability you will see more mobility and that's why the isolated testing has limitations because if you put somebody with both hands on the other foot on the floor they'll be able to express their maximal dorsiflexion but if somebody is trying to do a pistol for the first time they, they might not express as much dorsiflexion because they're so unstable their body's all over the place and having an awareness of how those movement qualities interact, I think is a big missing piece as to how traditional healthcare views injuries from a biomechanical point of view. Yeah. Um, I'd quite like to just go into a small rabbit hole. Let's do it. <laughs> Ask your opinion. Um, I'm not going to share mine, but I think you can probably understand why I'm going with it. But uh, what's your opinion on uh, inst intentional instability in rehab? um so specifically something like a bosu ball um yeah. or offsetting stability to turn on stabilizers etc um i think for most people the ground is unstable enough and we can do a lot of stability work get the stabilizers firing or however you want to talk about it without adding excessive instability i think there are certain athletes in certain situations where that might be appropriate but in general just doing the normal movement you're trying to work on with some sort of load or changing direction will train the skill of stability well and artificial instability is sort of like it's unnecessarily aggressively targeting the stabilizers when actually um, most people can derive a stability stimulus from more normal versions it, i mean i don't think it's necessarily bad for you but i don't think i've ever prescribed sort of bosu ball squats or anything um yeah. because yeah most people can work on their stability by doing more single leg versions which will probably have more carryover to what they actually want in their training i'm glad okay. <laughs> <You're past. laughs> um do, 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 can you give an example without putting you on the spot too much of where you would use that, where you would use that intentional instability? Because um, I, because I'm thinking in terms of um, specificity within sport, mm. and that's um, I kind of have a bit of a bug bugbear. I know that Ed feels the same way when you look at a lot of 
professional sports teams with some of the sports specific training that they're doing. Yeah. It's like, do, do they need to do any of that? Is that really that important? Uh, like, or is getting those muscles in the, in these planes of movement, the most important thing, or should we be doing more stuff that we're already doing on the field anyway? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's the key question for sports is basically a lot of things would have some benefit, however, tangential, but is it the best use of time? We're all limited by time and capacity to recover. So we should be trying to make the most from that. To answer the question about the BOSU ball, the only thing that comes immediately to mind is snowboarding, just in terms of overloading the ability to balance and correct. Um, imagine you like run over a, a ridge or like a bump you haven't seen, then you know the ground is changing underneath you. Yeah. So in that sense, the BOSU ball might have some specificity, but that's the only one that immediately comes to mind. Yeah, interesting. Good. Um, so I would like to understand your, uh, the people that you, the, with the people that you work with, particularly on the imbalance side, what do you see? Do you see, is there any like common trends within CrossFit versus Gen Pop? Um, and why, why do you think that is? I think the first thing that comes to mind is most injuries are overuse of some sort. You've, ex you've essentially exceeded your tissue tolerance, right? So whatever your body can handle, you've gone too far. I always say that you can, you can get used to pretty much anything if you progress slowly enough. So you could interpret almost any injury as you've just done too much too soon. And I think CrossFitters are particularly prone to this because they love training and they get very carried away. They jump in on extra workouts. And um, if the programming isn't smart, then that can create more opportunities for overuse because you might be repeating movement patterns or training beyond fatigue. Um, so that's probably like the overarching theme of thing that I see. But in terms of more specific patterns, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is stiff spines because in CrossFit, there's a huge amount of barbell work and a positive adaptation for handling a barbell is a stiff spine. Like if you are back squatting heavy, if you're deadlifting heavy, if you're front squatting, overhead squatting, basically any movement involving a barbell, having a stiff spine helps you do that movement. However, the problems arise when then you ask the spine to do something else. And in life, in other sports, the spine needs to side bend a lot more. It needs to rotate a lot more. So you've spent most of your training time in the gym telling the spine to be stiff, but then you go and ask your body to do something else, which requires a more supple spine and you get a mismatch. So generally like shoulders suffer a lot because of this, because the spine and the shoulders work together so closely. If the spine's not doing something, then the shoulder needs to pick up the slack. And because it is a relatively small joint compared to the hips um, that can cause some issues for the shoulder. So that's probably the number one um, pattern I see in CrossFit. Um, and just, well, a couple of things, well, let's go into the shoulder side. So you think, are you, are you saying you think that the, the majority of the shoulder overuse injuries that you see are due to um, instability or, or or rigidity within the spine like there there isn't enough flexibility within the spine or do you think that it's something else that's going on there talking about i guess because what i picked up from that was kind of like the flexibility versus stability mm. uh kind of like trade-off that you get yeah so what um, why do you think uh, obviously your shoulders just take a battering in crossfit anyway because of the amount of movements that get put through them yeah um but do you think that there's a a mechanical thing specifically that's going on there or you think it's just the tissue tolerance isn't there um i think the stiff spines there's also we need to address the fact that a lot of people work on the computer a lot of the time as well so that feeds into poor posture and non-ideal spinal mechanics um which also will lead to the shoulder injuries i think that if people move their spines more and better, there would be a huge amount less shoulder injuries. That's for sure. Um, but then, like we were talking about earlier, there's always a trade-off. So to have that spinal mobility and um, 
extra motion in the other two planes, you would trade off against how heavy your deadlift would be and how well you would back squat. So that's why cross, CrossFit's a difficult problem to solve because we're asking our body to do so many different things. It's never going to be optimal for any of them. So the correct balance of spinal stiffness is up for debate because mm. somebody with a stiffer spine will lift heavier, but somebody with a more supple spine might be better at gymnastics and have more robust shoulders. And I think because the sport's so new, we don't know what that optimal balance is. Yeah. If you look at the games athletes, they definitely tend towards the stiff spine and that is better for performing at the sport of CrossFit. But the sport of CrossFit doesn't play sat doesn't play tennis on a Saturday with their mates. And so many people I've seen have injured their shoulders playing tennis, even though they do loads of gym work, because my, my interpretation of their injuries is that their spine doesn't move enough. So the shoulder's doing too much and they're trying to muscle a shot, which should come flowing through the lower body and the trunk into the shoulder. Um, mm. so. so you think it's, it's a more of a, a mobility issue within that joint that's causing the issue? No, I so think, you think it's from the spine. Yeah. So basically the way I, I like to think about stuff like this is the body is a team that's trying to achieve an overall goal. So if the team's working in harmony, then no one player is going to get overused, get hurt, get injured. Yeah. So the shoulder is the guy who's trying to do everything in right. CrossFit because so much stuff goes through the shoulder. If he's having to pick up the slack for another part of the body, he's going to be first to complain because he doesn't have that much capacity because the muscles are smaller in the shoulder than other areas of the body, yeah. which is why like, when you're doing um, shoulder overheads or something, you want to use your lower body as much as you can because the shoulders will burn out sooner. So for shoulder injuries, if we could get the, like, the spine and even the lower body doing more, then the shoulder does less and it's not going to get overused. So I wouldn't say it's something specific about mobility just in the spine, but if we think about how the shoulder gets used in outside of the gym, the shoulder's never really used in isolation. If you're throwing a ball, if you're hitting a shot in tennis or golf or um, even like strongman stuff, you're using the whole body as one unit to perform mm -hmm. a movement. It's only really in the gym that we'll do just shoulder exercises. And by training it out of sequence with the rest of the body, we are asking for that part of the body to do more work than it naturally would. We're, we're kind of getting that one player on the team to try and play a match on his own. Mm. I think I've gone too far with that analogy. No, no, you yeah, take no, my point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, from uh, something else that I would um, throw into that is the, is how, how strong rather than kind of the, the, uh, the whole body moving uh, mm. or like, I guess what you're talking about is more kind of like bones moving in space um, is, is like what, what the muscles are doing. Um, and from what we've been learning about a lot um, recently is uh, some of the N1 stuff. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with. Yeah. And they've been talking about the, the pecs and the lats being much more integral to shoulder strength than the delts or the lower traps or whatever. So with shoulder injuries or occurrences within shoulder injuries, we should be looking at not so much like the shoulder itself, but like what's around the shoulder, what, if, and if we get those muscles stronger, that is in turn going to have much more carry over into helping that shoulder be as optimal as it can. Hugely. Yeah. Hugely agree with that. I think that was one of the major findings um, for my own injury in that we put way too much emphasis on the role of the rotator cuff in shoulder injuries yeah quite often they are the, just the innocent victim in that they're they're trying to do the job of the bigger muscles so if you look at an anatomy chart with all the muscles of the body we have really big clues as to which muscles should be doing the most work and they're just the biggest muscles right so yeah. the glutes are massive they should be doing lots of work in the lower body the lats are massive they're basically the glutes of the upper body so when it comes to controlling and using a shoulder if we don't have a big lat or big pecs doing their work, then only smaller muscles can do their job. 
And that's why rotator cuffs will get injured because they're little slithers of a muscle trying yeah, to do the job of, job of a massive lat. And this is the, where I went with my injury is that I probably had the strongest rotator cuffs in history because I did so many of the internal and external rotation exercises that I was prescribed. Yeah. But no matter how strong the rotator cuff becomes, it's never going to be able to produce as much force as a lat. So making sure the big muscles are doing the big work is step one in looking at a muscle imbalance assessment. And I'd say that covers a lot of people's injuries as, yeah, why has a small area of the body taken on the role of a, a big muscle group? And um, yeah, you're spot on in that pecs and lats should be doing the bulk of the work at the shoulder. So if they're yeah. not, then you've got a problem. Is, uh, is that what, it, how, how did you resolve your issue? With, within the trap you know was it you know pec lat issue was uh, something else going on yeah so it's a combination of getting my spine moving better and getting the spine moving better allows better lats recruitment like mine was primarily lats i wasn't using my lats very well and as soon as i got the spine moving better getting lats and actually a bit of rhomboids activation as well in the relevant movements um then literally it just calmed down so i met a movement specialist yeah, about seven years ago and I started going really down this path and he had me doing all these weird exercises where I was throwing my arms all over the place and it was the first time in 10 years that that trap just actually relaxed a little bit I felt muscles of my upper back and my lap switch on in a really uh, natural way I think that's the only way to describe it it wasn't like I was getting a pump in it it was like I was throwing my arms around and then all of a sudden my shoulder just felt like it found its natural home yeah. and that is what allowed the trap to calm down because the trap was spazzing out to try and stabilize the shoulder because the shoulder wasn't feeling stability from the areas of the body that it wanted to yeah. and um yeah as soon as the big muscles started doing what they should that's what enabled it to calm down yeah interesting i mean just going off that flexibility or uh, and stability piece within mm. the spine I guess that's the same thing you know um why it's so difficult with CrossFit, but you look at a, a, a sport that's a much more, you know, one specialism like powerlifting. Mm -hmm. you, you ask, you look at a powerlifter in terms of their mobility. They can't, they can't like, they struggle to get out of bed. Yeah. Like they can't tie their shoelaces up. You know, I'm talking elite. Yeah. Um, because the spine has had to create so much structure and stability for them to be able to, back squat 300 kilos or deadlift 400 kilos or whatever so you know the body is intentionally adapting to those the the stimulus that you're giving it so then this is a, um i also have a bit of a i have a bit of a bug bearer with like too much static stretching and um rom wad and foam rolling i think people are always uh are doing those things because they think or it's like old old literature or or just this is what they see people doing so they're like oh i need to do that and actually do you need to be spending all that time trying to stretch out your hamstrings because actually you're then about you're about to go and do four sets of 10 rdl with 80 kilos or something like that so um yeah. that's music to my ears and i completely agree i think tension is kind of demonized in training and that oh, i've got a tight muscle people think that's a problem but when we when we think about it a muscle only creates force through contraction. So the ability to create tension is what makes us strong. So when we're doing loads of static stretching, we're training lack of tension. We're, tra we're essentially training weakness. Mm. And I think we need to separate flexibility from range of motion because passive flexibility and ability, yeah, the ability to get into a position is useless unless we can get ourselves out of that position. So what we actually want to optimize for is usable range of motion. So if we're getting warm for a RDL, we want to be happy that we can achieve the position we want to train happily and get ourselves out of there. What we don't want is to train getting into that range of motion and then relaxing because yeah, if we're doing 80 kilo RDLs, that's going to end in a bad time. And that's yeah, also a massive bugbear of mine because it's, perpetuated as what a good fitness person does when actually it's very counter to a lot of people's goals and not a good use of their precious time. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a little recurring joke that we have, uh, um, 
coastal. Um, do you know uh, James Smith the, um, on Instagram, PT? Yeah. Um, he put out some, uh, some content a while ago of him just basically ripping apart the foam roller. Okay, uh, nice. And it was like, foam rolling does fucking nothing, mate. <laughs> uh, so I walked down and there's like eight people foam rolling. And I'm like, that's fucking nothing. Yeah. And everyone's like oh I like one time I got a foam roller out because my back was a little bit sore and everyone's like oh times are terrible <laughs> uh, yeah I'm glad we agree on that um I'd like to just dial back a little bit you talked about what you saw shoulders a lot mm -hmm. do you what what's your opinion on um I already know this but I'd like it to, for us to have a discussion and to share with our listeners but what, what's your opinion on Neve Algus specifically within squatting i think it's fine yeah, yeah. Um, Good. i think it's uh it's another one of these things that's get that's become demonized and one of the reasons i started uh, my own podcast was to actually do an episode on this because i was having this conversation so frequently i just thought i'll do this properly and then just send people the link so i don't need to have the conversation again yeah, that's cool. but essentially essentially knee valgus is a normal natural position it happens every time we take a step when we're walking or running and it happens in squatting because it is biomechanically advantageous and actually better um whenever you're struggling with a rep your body will try and find the most efficient way to get the job done and that's the reason why we dip into valgus when we're struggling with squats. If you look at the best weightlifters in the world, you look at Tia Claire Toomey, she exhibits a huge amount of knee valgus and she's one of the best lifters. And as far as I know, she hasn't had any major knee injuries as a result of that. And I've looked into this extensively and essentially the reason why people think knee valgus is bad is because it's linked to ACL injuries and ACL injuries do happen in a position of knee valgus but generally in field sports on one leg, potentially with a collision and or studs planted into the turf. Yeah, shear um, forces. Exactly, yeah. Or, or falling from a big jump in basketball or volleyball or something. So the logic just doesn't add up. It's We're avoiding knee valgus in squatting because people do ACLs from a position of valgus in field sport. And also the logic there is that just because the injury happens in the position of knee valgus, it doesn't mean that position is inherently something we should avoid. It's like saying, oh, somebody hyperextended their elbow tumbling in gymnastics. Therefore, we should never lock out our elbows. It's mm. just not a valid way of thinking. So I think there are more injuries or more issues caused by excessive knee varus when you drive your knees to the outside and load. This is the reason I've had this conversation so many times is because I have loads of crossfitters who come to see me with knee injuries or knee issues or other issues which are caused because they've been coached to excessively drive their knees out mm -hmm. and that can cause a whole host of other issues um so my stance on knee valgus is as long as the movement is controlled and we've got a nice three points of contact through the foot and the hip and the knee function sorry the ankle and the hip function well just let the knee go where it wants to and that should be fine the um i i know you, i know you've heard, heard this counter before but the it, it would be to the the, the idea of cr driving the knees out not excessively but enough to create space for the pelvis to be able to drop um to that would that would be the only thing that i would say is because well from i i think we yeah, as you know the when the with the femur in the pelvis it runs into space if it's going straight in that position so uh a, a, some external rotation of the femur allows for that pelvis to drop down a little bit deeper what what do you you so you think that there's sure. like a but there's just a balance between the two yeah there's a balance between the two it depends how deep you want to squat um and this is why people might have a wider stance so they might have a toe out stance but they're still moving towards valgus if that makes sense because the internal rotation is the crucial part of loading the legs before you stand up a squat yeah. and if you're driving your knees out you're fighting internal rotation so you can start with wider feet or with toes turned out and experience internal rotation from an ex externally rotated starting position if that yeah. makes sense so as long as there is internal rotation through the movement then you will get 
good loading mechanics of the muscles involved. And I think even, yeah, you touched on another good important caveat in that in Olympic weightlifting, there is a case to drive your knees out to improve your bar path. If you get your knees out the way, depending on your lever lengths, that is a situation where I would allow or encourage knees getting out of the way because the bar path is so important that if you were going around your knees, it would impact your performance. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like the Ch Chinese uh, Olympic weightlifters, they, they actually cue for you to drive your knees in and you look at so many Chinese weightlifters when they're cleaning or when they're like squatting, front squatting like 300 kilos, those knees are coming in. Um, and you, you've talked about this before, but um, w w when you were doing your, your mentorship with Red Pill, you talked about um, the, the, the femur and the patella of a, of a cow. Yes. Can you just explain that a little bit? So, yeah, this, this is a great um, piece of understanding for both like the understanding of ACL injuries. Like, so we actually had the whole leg of a cow and basically the ACL connects the tibia to the femur and we cut away everything except the ACL. And we had like four of up two on each end of each bone, trying to pull it apart, trying to twist it. It's like tougher than a seatbelt. It's unbelievably strong. Really? So the idea that, yeah, the idea that you could create enough force through that ACL in a squat using both legs is quite, um, yeah, unbelievable. But the other thing that it really showed us was once you hold the bones in your hand and you're flexing and extending this knee, the basically the end of the bone in the femur, there's two heads and it lines up with grooves in the back of the kneecap. And when you push a knee into varus towards the outside, they no longer line up and the heads of the femur are kind of going across the grooves in the back of the patella. You also see that the meniscus becomes compressed on one side and the flexing and extending feels grindy. Whereas if you move the knee towards valgus, slightly inside of where the, uh, the leg would point, everything lines up perfectly. The meniscus is nice and even. There's no excessive compression on one side and the bones just glide over each other really smoothly. And once I'd seen that, no one, no one can convince me that varus is better than some, a small amount of valgus or even a big amount of valgus. It was also impressive to see how far you could move into valgus and it would still be a happy knee right. compared to driving it outwards. As soon as you got knee outside the line of the foot and the hip, you can see it just doesn't want to be there. And I think that should be a part of um, normal fitness education as to what, where a knee wants to be. And once you've seen the, yeah, the, uh, the anatomy in your hands, you can't it, you'd struggle to believe that knees out is better than knees in yeah i, I it's just not it's just not aware enough uh, um i mean I, i've been i've been saying the not so much about valgus being a positive because i have in the past been guilty of teaching knees out maybe not excessively yeah. but to create space for the pelvis um but yeah it's it, no one's ever you look at the elite of weightlifting and there's so much knee valgus like yeah. how many people you know what's what if if all of those weightlifters were dropping like flies then we'd know about it and they would be preventing that from happening because they otherwise they wouldn't be winning medals exactly. yeah um uh, uh, something that i would link that to the kind of the idea that when people see knee valgus they go oh like assuming that it's a bad thing um is is the rounding of the back in the deadlift mm -hmm. Um, which I think, again, is incorrectly taught a lot. And I've been guilty of this, which has actually led to a back injury myself where, you know, it was, you know, entry level coaching. It was like back flat. And what, what, what does a flat back mean? Um, and for some people, it depends on your spine. But uh, and we've talked about this a lot um, at Coastal, but some people are naturally kyphotic where their, their upper back is slightly rounded. So for them to have a flat back, they would be in extension. Whereas other people that are naturally in extension for them to have a rounded back would be way beyond their level of flexion that they would need to the spine. But often when people look at a back position in a deadlift and they're set in a rounded position, 
they people think oh my god they're about to this disc is about to explode out of their spine yeah but actually you know if that is in a neutral range and you're able to set in that position then it's it's the most optimal way for you to be deadlifting as opposed to starting in a flat back position and then your spine moves under load exactly it's the, it's the same um as the weightlifters. if you look at the top power lifters how many of them have got perfectly flat backs when they're pulling the heaviest deadlifts ever yeah. almost none yeah and it's because it's stronger <laughs> like it is stronger it yeah. produces more force so i think the notion of correct form i don't know where a lot of it comes from someone sort of just drawn it up in a textbook to say i think this is what it should look like mm. without a huge amount of um critical review like no one's challenging why it's like why people were told not to squat without squat with their knees over toes or lunge with letting your knee go over your toe and that was just taken as true for such a long time and it's only relatively recently that people have started to chat to challenge those um those notions and yeah i think that's a great example as well the the, the back in the deadlift is just um yeah it's like you're a bad person if you have a round back deadlift yeah you might be a strong person so <laughs> yeah maybe it's worth it um i do want to talk about knees over toes sure. but um one thing that i that i've heard about with knee valgus in squatting is the idea that it's like a power dump that you know it's the same as well that it's considered the same as um bar displacement or the bar being far away from your body when you're say snatching or cleaning um you want that you don't want to have any lateral movement of the bar um and yeah. the power and the knees driving in excessively is that taking away potentially from the knees driving straighter which would which could lead to a more force being produced upwards yeah yeah that's definitely a valid challenge and i think um if we think about the optimal line of force, it's straight. So that's why if we can, having our feet under our hips is optimal. It's only in a squat because we need the mobility um, to get lower into the squat range that we might go wider and the extra stability that that provides from a wider base of support. But yeah. if you could squat with your feet under your hips and tick all those boxes, it would be more efficient. And that is a valid challenge uh, to say that the knees deviating away from straight can cause um can could result in less efficient transfer of force however the knees are always going away from straight because they're bending anyway so you can't bend your knee without the knee going forwards yeah. in space so that's you're going away from straight anyway and the thing that we need to measure is how much force is lost from the knees moving medially into valgus versus the extra muscle recruitment that we get because the knees move, me, move medially into valgus. Yeah. And without being able to measure those, um, maybe there's a way of measuring them that I'm not aware of just yet. The body tends to figure out the most efficient way of doing things. So that's why the knees just dip into valgus when someone's doing their one rep max. So if it was more efficient for the knee to stay straight over the foot, then it would happen when people were maxing out. But the body and the subconscious is far more powerful than our conscious uh, movement control. So I think if that was the case, then the body would naturally tend towards it, but it's not. Um, yeah. And you, uh, you, you talked about um, glute max being mm -hmm. recruited greater with a small amount of knee valgus. Yeah. Is that the case with excessive knee valgus? Is there kind of like a point where the glute max doesn't fire as much if the knees come in too much? From individual to individual, possibly. But in terms of the principle, like the principle of loading glute max is we want to take the origin away from the insertion, right? So we want the muscle to stretch so it can get a stretch reflex. Yeah. And the glute max loads with hip flexion, so knee coming up, hip a deduction, the knee going inwards, and also hip internal rotation. So valgus is all of those three together. And that's why the body does it, because the glute max is the biggest, strongest muscle in the body. So your body is trying to get the most stretch reflex out of it when mm. squatting heavy or under fatigue. So the more, the better. 
provided it's controlled. And the caveat there is that some people won't be able to recruit from maximal length in a muscle. Neurologically, they don't have the coordination. So once it goes beyond a certain point, the body might shut down to protect itself. So it isn't a case of more is always better, but in general it is. Like uh, the more stretch reflex we can get out of a muscle, the more force it will be able to produce provided it's controlled. So it's not like if you've squatted knees out your whole life, suddenly drive your knees in as far as you can and you're one rep max. I wouldn't advise that because it won't be controlled and you haven't built up the tissue tolerance and and control from the nervous system to justify throwing yourself into that position yeah i guess that's similar to what you were talking about with like other muscles having to take over when those muscles the the other muscles aren't firing same if you suddenly change that movement or that technique but try and go max me again it's gonna end in you know like a rotator cuff having to do 20 times the amount of force it would normally or something exactly um Within that, talking about glutes, um, what's your view on glute bands? Um, I have never used them and never prescribed them. I think one of the concepts that I always talk about in my mentorship is the spectrum of specificity. So whenever we're evaluating the usefulness of an exercise, we want to understand what we're trying to achieve and how relevant this exercise is to that end goal Mm. and the principle is we should always work as high up the spectrum of specificity as we can provided we achieve the right training stimulus so when we're choosing an exercise we're always trying to identify the training stimulus we're looking to elicit what's the training stimulus that we want from glute bands it's glute activation it's what's that glute activation for generally for squatting so can we get glute activation in squatting without going all the way back down to a band because the band does get you feeling your glutes but actually we want glute activation for a specific movement so can we get the glutes firing um, for a squat without moving so far away from it because then we get so many more incidental carryovers because the movement pattern will get trained more effectively at the same time we're getting more skill acquisition and we're also working on our relevant mobility and stability demands of the movement that we're training So doing a squat variation or a lunge variation, which has a much more in common with a squat, for me is a much better use of time. Not that a glute band is hurting anybody, but I think it's just pretty low down that spectrum of specificity. Yeah. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong with this, but my understanding is that the, when you abduct your, your thighs or your femurs, Mm -hmm. um, primarily the glutes that are doing that are going to be your glute med and glute min the smaller glutes versus yeah. the glute max so when people are driving their knees excessively into a band doing hip thrusts really what's taking over that is the smaller glutes as opposed to the glute max which is what we which is the bit like you said the biggest strongest muscle in the body so then perhaps would there, there be could be an argument that we're training again it's like smashing the rotator cuff we're training the smaller muscles and and programming your body to fire those as opposed to find the bigger muscle exactly yeah yeah exactly perfectly explained and i think um it's also encouraging that knees out right that the, the conscious contraction of yeah glute min and glute med is hip abduction which is knees out mm. and that's almost like it's more of a bodybuilding mind muscle connection approach. Whereas moving fluidly for function for sport is subconscious. So we should just be thinking about the overall task rather than, yeah, that mind muscle connection or really isolated joint movements. And I think glute min and glute med will get trained in squatting and lunging as well, but they'll just get trained proportionally. And I think that's the key thing that just doing the right movements in the right way everything works harmoniously together. So you get a really balanced training effect. As soon as we start trying to isolate things out, we are are by that very nature creating imbalance because we're training the body in an imbalanced way. And it's just a catch-all sort of 
safety blanket policy that if you train everything together, it will pretty much level up together. Mm. If you train things on their own, you are like, if we go back to that team analogy, you're training your left back, but your whole midfield's taking a day off. Like why would a football team do that? There are some situations where that's necessary if there is a massive imbalance to correct, but in general, the more comprehensively we can train the body, the more comprehensively we should train the body. Yeah. I mean, anecdotally, I, I was have, having listened to you talk on some other podcasts before this and had a play around with some Neve Algus mo- movements, not excessively. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. I mean, the other day I was doing some some hip thrusts with a barbell and normally I would uh, I'd have my toes turned out and my knees kind of driving towards like as you would kind of with a squat a lot of the time where people say oh you should be driving out towards the outside like what we've talked about incorrectly really Mm. um and i intentionally created a little bit of valgus as i squeezed up and the glute pump was just mental like the the the, i could feel like talking about that mind muscle connection like the change in how hard i was hitting the glutes and then it's the same with like um like a hamstring curl on a machine the difference between you turning your feet out and turning your feet in you can feel a real difference in the muscles that are contracting within your hamstring um and that's why you know we've we we do a lot um with our process programming stuff about um getting people to do lots of the bodybuilding work so they understand you know what it feels like to contract this muscle or what it feels like to do this muscle so that when you were talking about when they go back into a position or like a sport where they shouldn't be thinking about that stuff yeah their body knows what it feels like to to do those things without them having to consciously think about it exactly yeah i think we talk about this as a concept called integrated isolation so in if in that analogy of your body as a team there is still a business case for relative bias of muscle groups so say you, you're let's go with that football team analogy again say you've identified that you're not very good at crossing the ball in training you could set up drills to play through balls to the winger cross it in and then striker gets on the end of it you can set that up rehearse and replicate that part of the sport but the team's still working together. So it, it's not just the winger like, putting in crosses all day. And that would help a little bit, but it's actually the interplay of the midfielder playing the through ball, the winger putting the cross in, and then the striker finishing it. Mm. Them training together as a, as a mini team will in, improve the actual game performance because if we only did the crossing of the ball from the winger, the striker's never developing that understanding of how he likes to cross the ball or you know the communication between them and it's the same with our muscle groups if we're only ever training the hamstring in isolation how is it going to interact with the glute with the calf with the quads in a complex movement it it's just not getting that stimulation whereas if we can do some integrated isolation to get that hamstring functioning better but then we integrate it with more compound movements where the timing and the sequencing and the motor patterns are rehearsed to find the relative contribution from each part of the body, then the overall pattern benefits. And this is, this is why people who, who do only bodybuilding look quite disjointed when they play sport. They kind of waddle around and they quite often pull muscles when they go for a kick around because they have developed the capacity of those muscles fully in isolation and actually the interplay between them is disjointed and is dysfunctional so the overall task isn't completed effectively whereas i think most people know people who only play sport and don't train they're actually very resilient in their sport because they're constantly using the body as an overall unit which works harmoniously together Mm. to to fulfill the overall task yeah i think that's a lesson that everyone who goes to the gym should really take is that what am i using my body for because if i want to go and play tennis then I should be conditioning my body a bit more specifically towards tennis rather than only bench pressing. And uh, the shoulder will benefit massively because it's such a specific uh, conditioning. So I, within what you do and your, your content that you post within like stimulus six and things like that, for example, mm-hmm. 
which we we can define for the listeners in a second but it's kind of what my my question to you would be the 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 progression or the interplay from that body weight lunge or Mm -hmm. or a shoulder stretch into someone say hitting a forehand in tennis or a crossfitter doing a maximal snatch yeah um because like we're talking about with your body reverting to patterns that it either knows or that are optimal for it we can do loads of lunge matrixes or 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 um kind of like activation exercises with body weight and with a 2.5 kg dumbbell and then go into our training and everything reverts back to that old movement pattern because you've got 40 50 100 kilos on the bar yeah versus your body weight so where where is that line or how how does that kind of translate how do you translate that from the initial stages into into sport yeah really good question so the the way i would approach this would be where are we today and where do we want to get to like any training journey we've got a baseline to know what the current state of affairs is and then we need to create stepping stones to get from where we are to where we want to be so what's the end goal because if the end goal is snatching 120 kilos or the end goal is playing a five set match of tennis without shoulder blowing out the preparation is very different and to sort of explain that stimulus six thing it's an approach i have for essentially putting variations around a standard exercise so if you're doing a lunge there are three planes of motion sagittal frontal and transverse sagittal's forwards back frontal side to side transverse is rotating left and right and the simplest way to just add in some movement variety is to go in both directions in all three planes of motion and it's just the simplest way to create a stimulus to improve a joint function full stop without any further thinking so if you're wanting wanting to warm up your feet and ankles knees and hips doing the stimulus six lunges you're going through all those different planes of motion in both directions and you've experienced so much more movement variety than you would have done by just doing the same amount of forward back lunges and i guess your question is how do we move from that towards sport or end training and it's just like any training journey or scaling of an exercise what where are we now so what's our current training look like and what do we need to be able to do to achieve our sports in the way that we want to so it does vary depending on who we're talking about because somebody who's never trained before obviously would be very different somebody who trains a lot but essentially that spectrum of specificity will guide us like what's the training stimulus we need to do our sport better so say somebody is missing hip adduction so they're missing frontal plane hip motion which means they're not recruiting glute med for snatching for example we then need to go down the spectrum of specificity to find an exercise that creates that training stimulus so maybe it's a silly lunge where we're doing a forward lunge with a reach over the top with that hip drive which will get glute med working so now we've got glute med actually firing up what are the bridging steps we need to take to make that look a little bit more like snatching and once it looks a little bit more like snatching how do we recreate the loads that that athlete is going to be dealing with so that We've got glute med working. We've got glute med working in the relevant motor pattern. And then we've got glute med working in the relevant motor pattern with relevant loads. And it's just like any scaling journey. Just we need to progressing. F- exactly. You need to fill in the gaps. Yeah. And it's complex because we're looking at more movement qualities than normal. So it's not as simple as just weight on the bar scaling. But because we have a, an understanding of these different movement qualities, we can make better decisions about making the movements more specific. So even though they might look silly, they actually have more carryover to what the athlete is trying to work towards. And um, I think that's a huge area for coaches to explore that we need to just step outside the normal versions of exercises and realize that they're all up for grabs. We can tweak them however we want to get the training stimulus that we want and um, better achieve our goals, basically. 
I guess that's the power of a coach's eye uh, or your eye in that instance, because, and this is the kind of the, the, you know, the trade-off between online coaching versus in person is that you, you know, when you're, where if you, you know what it is that you're looking for, what movement is the causing the issue, mm. someone, you know, you might say glute mead or whatever, and they're kind of like, oh, I kind of know what that is. Or like, you know, but they start snatching and they keep forgetting or their body is just reverting back to it. And, yeah. you know, it's very difficult to do that just through videos or just online. Like it needs, you need to be able to be able to cue that ta- with tactile cueing, you know, it, be able to describe it to them and to be able to correct it so i guess that's you know a definite positive that one one in what one nil to training in person especially when you're working with a coach for sure exactly yeah and i think that's one of the reasons why i've shifted my focus more towards education because i want more coaches to to develop this coach's eye to so that more people can benefit from it because Mm. excuse me traditional fitness education just doesn't really put that much emphasis on the movement mechanics side of things and I think there's just huge potential for us coaches to do our jobs better if we're just if we're aware of these things then we can spot them but until we have developed our vocabulary around describing what we're seeing how can we look to address it in specific terms and I think we might have lost a few listeners just with all the technical a discussion around joint motions and the specific muscles we're, we're talking about but that really is the level of understanding we should have when working with the body because you know everyone knows a bicep curl stimulates the bicep but can we accurately describe what muscles are involved in a squat and at what point in time they're involved in the squat and i think that's quite tough and th- just because it's tough it doesn't mean we should avoid it and i think everyone would benefit with a little bit more understanding of that as a standard in the industry yeah it's funny because when i was doing my uh degree in sports science what i what i disliked the most was biomechanics okay. but at the moment it's what uh, along with anatomy it's what i'm learning the most about at the moment and it's having so much more carryover into my ability to coach and either through the education of me being able to give that to clients or to members or to, for them to learn that themselves, like you say, is just so much more powerful than a cue of, oh, drive your knees out or drive your knees in. Like they, people need to understand the mechanics or like why it is that we need to do this yeah. and have a basic understanding to do that. Yeah. Spot on. I guess just going back into that, um, I think an a important thing that you were talking about there is specificity within the movements that we're doing. And where I would have, um, looking at at your social media from the outside in, um, I think you could could look at some of the Instagram posts, maybe say, for example, the Stimulus 6 lunges, where Mm -hmm. you're lunging forwards, sideways with rotations, which is what we were talking about going through the three different planes of movement. Mm -hmm. Um, But someone would see that and think that they then have to implement that Stimulus 6 into their training categorically without really understanding what it is that they're working towards whereas obviously you know what it is why someone is doing that and the reasons behind why they need to do it um and i think that's kind of like the issue that i take with um like fitness it's social media in general is it's so clickbaity and people will take whatever it uh, whatever they see as gospel and that it needs to apply to them when what you're talking about is within say go back to that snatch analogy in the glute mead yeah if they're not having those issues then them like you're talking about the time constraint them wasting five minutes doing their lunge matrix isn't really going to benefit them at all Mm. whereas then we did something different with the shoulder but they actually knew that they were having an issue with the shoulder and that was something they needed to turn on a specific muscle, then that's where it's, it's important. So I think everyone needs to understand the importance of the movements that you're doing, be, being specific to yourself. Like you said, that specificity hierarchy, like how we need to be as specific as we can to ourselves, not yeah. just because the movement looks cool or because we want to be up here like we're warming up correctly or something. 
yeah, spot on. I think, well, <clears throat> one thing I challenge is that a lunge matrix is never a waste of time, but I think <laughs> <laughs> you're biased. Yeah, I am very biased in that. But I think, um, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there that in this social media era, everyone running a business is trying to get eyes on their business to advertise what they do. And um, I think fitness has become quite a distorted has the way it's been represented online is very distorted in that nobody wants to see people do the basics that they already know about people want to see something new they want to see something different and if you're you're scrolling without any discernment as to what you're working towards it's very easy to get waylaid with whatever some sexy person is doing because Maybe that's what that's the secret as to why they're so sexy. Yeah. And uh, I think um, having that North Star of like, this is what I'm training towards. Does this piece of information help me get there if I'm an athlete? And if I'm a coach, does this piece of information slot into my arsenal of strategies and tactics to help my clients get towards their goal? Because, yeah, depending on who I'm working with, that may or may not be a good idea to use that particular tool. And I think, yeah, you've articulated it perfectly there that we need to just always be conscious of where it fits into our toolkit and not pull out the wrong tool for the job. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and another, uh, something else I'm going to ask your opinion on is uh, knees over toes. Um, yeah. So I feel like within the, the industry of some coaches, they are that he gets some some stick now within athletes and within some coaches they're like this is amazing this is well it's not groundbreaking but it's become groundbreaking to the masses because it's managed to reach so many people but i've also seen coaches talking about it not being the best case for everyone in terms of application mm -hmm. i don't really understand why they're saying that i'd like to hear your opinion on the knees over toes we've had him on the podcast a couple of times oh, um and yeah just like what, what's your what's your view on firstly you know what had that application to it and uh, you know the processes behind it sure um yeah well i guess overall i think ben patrick's a great guy and i really respect what he's doing in the industry he's clearly very passionate with good intentions and i like the way he's going about his business in terms of the knees over toes um criticism i'm not sure exactly why they're criticizing it mm. because i think a piece that probably gets missed in the way that he does things is that everything is very scalable so people don't like it because the program can be too basic in that they're doing these really um yeah basic versions of exercises with, and they want to just be slinging around heavy weights which is why they they're not interested in spending their time on it but on a principle basis, working towards full ranges of motion with good control is a good thing for most people. Whether it's the best use of their time as an athlete is another question. But in terms of danger, because everything's scalable to real basic variations, there should be no risk involved. Like if you're working in a range of motion that you're safe in and your training volume is sensible, then you're just moving and that's going to be good for you. Yeah. And I think that's sort of my stance on it. And if we go back to that framework of where am I today and where do I want to be? Depending how poor your movement is, you might actually have good dorsiflexion, good range of motion through the hips, and actually you're fine with where you are from that perspective and you want to spend your energy on training in other ways because you don't want to be able to do the crazy stuff he does, that's fine. If your movement is terrible, then we probably do need to improve your range of motion. We do need to work on your knees over toes movements. Um, so that element of individualization, I think needs to be um, taken into consideration before a broad brush statement of his stuff is shit or his stuff is amazing. It's just, there's no nuance. I think that's another thing about the online era is that people want blanket statements of this is good, this is bad, and there are no exceptions. But 
you know, his program is going to be great for a lot of people. It's not going to be ideal for many people. And it might be not a great use of time for another group of people. Um, he's just putting it out there because that's the thing that he's passionate about. So I yeah. don't have any issues with it. Yeah. And I guess going back to what we were talking about before, essentially the mechanism behind it is you're just getting the, the, the larger muscle groups that support the knee to be strong. Yeah. Um, and I know that he's done some upper body stuff as well. I don't really, I haven't uh, read into it too much, but I'm pretty familiar with, you know, what he's trying to do where he's saying you need to get the glutes strong. You need to get the hips strong. You need to get the quads, hamstrings, the tibs, the calves are all involved in having that, um, having that knee functioning as it needs to be and trading that through as much range of motion as you can. Mm -hmm. to allow for connection tissues to grow stronger as well as well as those big muscles yeah uh, i've actually got a series of posts lined up which i haven't got around to yet going through the biomechanics of some of the movements because some of them even have i think unintended benefits so like the tib raise that he does against the wall that has great benefits in terms of how the heel bone the calcaneus moves and can get mobilized for walking right. and i think um yeah, he almost doesn't know how good some of those movements are. Mm. And uh, yeah, I think there's, yeah, probably more benefits than initially come, uh, come to the fore when looking at them. Yeah. I forgot to um, ask at the start, how much time have you got? Have you got to bounce quickly or are you okay? No, I've got, I reckon I've got 20 minutes. Okay, Yeah. great. So I'd, I'd like uh, us to talk about what we, or we actually talked said we'd like to talk about today um yeah. but we've we've taken a long winding road there but that's <laughs> yeah. okay um and something we, that we the the question that we discussed was how functional is functional training and the movements that we consider functional yeah. um so i guess kind of like taking the reins off for you yeah. um what wh wh why why does that question resonate with you yeah, it's uh, something that um, we did a whole episode about on Nungeon Lift, but basically the word functional has to be in reference to something. Like it's a functional raincoat. It does the job, mm. but we need to know what that job is before we can evaluate whether it's functional or not. So functional fitness has a presumption that we know what the function of a human is. And I think functional fitness as a sport, like the sport of CrossFit is very distinct from the day-to-day -day demands on a human body. And everybody is an individual who does individual things with their body. So actually functional fitness should be specific to what you want the function of your body to be. So doing like heavy squat snatches for a uh, 80 year old grandmother and all she wants to do is stay active stay independent and play with her great grandchildren she doesn't need to do that and that isn't functional for her but for somebody who wants to go to the crossfit games and win then that is functional for them so i think the first piece is just getting very clear on what you actually want to use your body for and i think the the um, counterpoint to that would be, okay, well, we want to be generally physically prepared. We want our body to be robust and able to do normal day-to-day -day things. And so if that's the case, my stance on this is that we don't place enough emphasis on locomotion because our body is meant to move. So we're meant to transport ourselves through space. But a lot of what we do in the gym is very static. With, there's a lot of static strength with doing squats and deadlifts and cleans, none of which involve actually moving through space, which is one, another reason why I'm a big advocate of walking lunges, that we actually train our body to take us somewhere and condition it for gait. Um, so I think if I was to oversimplify, actually strongman training has a lot more in it than um, many functional fitness programs do that carry overs, carries over to general physical preparedness. Mm. You're picking up heavy stuff, awkward stuff that's not symmetrically loaded. You're carrying it, you're dragging it, 
you're moving through space. And in terms of what people actually use their body for on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, there's no point squatting 200 kilos if you get knee pain when you walk to the shops. And I think we would do a lot better by having a more thorough evaluation of what we actually want to be able to do with our body before undertaking a training journey. Because if we're very clear on where we want to get to, then it makes those decisions of how we get there a lot easier. Whereas trying to broad brush, slap on a generic set of movements, which may have high specificity, but equally may have very low specificity to what we actually want to be able to do, mm. um, I think is my two cents on the matter. So going off an example that you talked about with, with more lunging, um, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, the difference between it being static and it being a walking lunge. Yep. So what, what, what's so special about the, the walking lunge other than the fact that locomotion, so the movement of the body mm -hmm. rather than it being set in one specific position. Yeah. Well, I think that's, it's a big difference. The fact that you're moving compared to lunging and returning is lunging and returning. You're training, moving backwards, right? You're going into the lunge and then coming back to your start points. So you've gone nowhere. Whereas in a walking lunge, you're practicing the skill of moving from one leg to the other and moving forwards. So that, that, swing phase of gait where you say you step onto your right foot and then you step through your left foot swings through and goes onto the other side that is gait that is locomotion that's walking and that's running and that's sprinting so that is completely bypassed in a static lunge because we're only ever in that forward portion of the movement and Obviously, space constraints can factor into why we would do static lunges, and I still do static lunges. Um, but I think the walking lunge just has so much more specificity. If we use that spectrum of specificity, it's got more things in common with walking and with running than a static lunge and return does. So if we can do it, we'll get more bang for our buck from every rep than if we're doing static lunges. And is that, uh, are you saying then that, that it's because of, because of the dynamic movement that's going on there, is it then in turn creating much more activation of different muscles and, and tendons and ligaments having to work slightly differently as well? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So if we look at the anatomy, it's very clear that our muscles are set up for gait. The, the situation that we see of where muscles originate and insert onto the bones is for gait. And I don't think anyone could reasonably argue against that just in terms of the bone rotations and joint motions that activate muscles, all muscles, like even in the upper body, they will be activated through arm swings, corresponding arm swings that go with the lower body um, walking. So the body wants to be trained in that way. And when we're doing strange exercises that are very unlike gait, we're actually training the body it's like speaking a slightly different language to it it doesn't quite understand why we're doing it like that whereas you know running is very natural we've we've evolved running so um i think training our body in the way that it likes to be trained is only a good thing yeah i think it, yeah it all comes down to again the intention and the reasoning behind it so like we were talking about before about getting a muscle stronger like is a walking lunge going to be optimal if initially we want to build some tissue to be able to then recruit glute max greater or quads greater maybe not but then you want to if you're trying to strive towards being able to walk better and to be able to walk up the stairs or be able to bend down for your kids or whatever then progressing to that is optimal but not necessarily where people should start would you agree with that or I would say, I would just say scale the thing you want to do. So rather than having that like more bodybuilding hypertrophy phase, your body will grow enough muscle to do the job if you do the job. Right. So if you're looking to play with your grandkids, where are you today? What, what could you pick up a bag of sugar from your left foot? Could you do that? okay, how do we fill in the blanks between you being able to do that and pick up your 20 kilo 
grandchild. We could do a glute hypertrophy phase because we recognize that the glutes aren't very strong. Or we could just go straight for the goal and say, I want the glute to be strong in that movement pattern. So I just scale it back to a level that's appropriate for your level today to do that movement pattern. And then everything gets trained in proportion. So we're almost overcomplicating it. Just, just do the thing, but do the thing sensibly at a level that isn't too much too soon. Mm. And that is actually a more direct path to get to your goal. If you have aesthetic goals and it's a different conversation because you want to grow your glutes, fine. But don't pretend that it's because it's a more direct path to doing the thing you want to do. Because if you know that clearly, then actually it's a very simple training path. My, my only counter to that would be thinking about um, like when we were talking about the start with like a snatch and an injury mm -hmm. is we're, we're trying to break down that movement in a sense to be able to understand it so that they can then get back to that movement. So it's, I guess it's still, they're, they're almost two different things really in a way. Um, but that's, yeah, it's, it's different that we are intentionally breaking that down to correct movement pattern, I guess, for them to then be able to do it optimally. Whereas here, it's not so much a correction of movement pattern. It's just making the movement slightly less challenging for them to be able to be functional. Yeah, exactly. You're spot on there. I think for the snatch, where are we today? We're injured and we've got some dysfunction. So actually the training stimulus that's the most direct step towards snatching isn't snatching today because we need to sort some stuff out before we can then use the full snatch motor pattern. So it's the same mm. principle, but it just looks different as a journey because what the body needs at that point in time isn't quite snatching. Yeah. So within strongman movements that you're talking about that you, that you, that you advocate for, mm -hmm. um, what, what's going on with those movements? It's just, it's just the, that it's going through so many planes of motion or that the muscles are being activated compared to something a little bit more basic. What, what's so advantageous to strongman? I think it's just more similar to how most people use their bodies. That's really the, the high level summary. Um, most people walk around, they carry stuff, they pick stuff up, they put it down and very rarely is it in perfect bilateral stance with a perfectly symmetrical loading tool. Mm. So just, yeah, you get those planes of motion that you talk about and you're controlling an odd object, which, you know, bags of shopping are never evenly loaded. One side, <laughs> one, one hand's always lifting something heavier than the other side. Yeah. So in terms of what we're actually using our body for, that's better, um, that's, it's more specific than doing a heavy deadlift, for example. And one of the things that I'd push a lot is a 3D deadlift matrix where you're like, generally as a warm up for the deadlift, we're using dumbbells and reaching in all three directions, all three planes of motion with various different ranges. And I say to people all the time, I think most people would be way better off building up to do a 3D deadlift matrix with 22 and a half kilo dumbbells than having a 200 kilo deadlift. But 200 kilo deadlift is so much sexier and more glamorous but in terms of actually how they use their body post on instagram as well exactly yeah it's more glam worthy <laughs> which is the main thing um <laughs> but uh yeah in terms of how people use their body how people throw their backs out if your back was robust in leaning over to one side and picking something pretty heavy up like 22 and a half kilos is a lot of weight mm. it's like it's the suitcase limit it's over the suitcase limit for most people so if you can pick that up at an odd angle away from your body without throwing your back out, that's actually a way better place to be than be able, being able to pick up 200 kilos in a perfect setup, perfectly balanced with a perfectly balanced bar. But because there's 200 kilos on the bar, it has way more appeal. And don't get me wrong, I've been there. I've definitely um, put my time in with the barbell. But it always comes back to what you want from your training if you want to go to the crossfit games and you need at least you know the deadlifting way over 200 kilos but if general physical preparedness for the everyday athlete is what we're looking at then actually a huge amount more movement variation would be beneficial and it's just the trade-off of um keeping people engaged i think is the other thing because it is so much less sexy than the heavy lifting yeah and you're trying to give your clients your athletes and your members enough of what they want so that you give them a chance to give them what they need that 
age old adage. And I guess uh, it's that's going into training in a, a, an out training out of position as well as in position in a way that you're you're preparing yourself for the potential for you to be pulled in one direction or another, um, so that if that does happen when you get heavy, your 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 body is able to tolerate it. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the GPP. We want to be prepared. So what are the eventualities that could be forced upon our body? Like we could like be trying to pick up a grandchild who's having a tantrum and they wriggle away from us. You know, if we're only deadlifting in perfect setup, we actually don't have strength or control in that awkward angle. Mm. Whereas if you've done your deadlift matrix, you would. And yeah, if that is what we're working towards, then that's what we should be doing more. Great. Ash, thank you for coming. Uh, where can people find you? Um, my Instagram is ashgrossman.coach with two N's at the end of Grossman because it's a bit German. And um, also I have my own podcast, podcast with, which I co-host with Rob Stubbs called Lunge and Lift. Um, please check that out. And I also have set up a new company called The Training Stimulus, which is where I'm doing all my coach education and uh, one-to-one coaching as well. So yeah, if you want to hit me up on any of those channels, I'll be glad to hear from you. Great. Thanks so much for coming on to the Process Podcast, Ash. Um, I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Hope so. Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. mate.